Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Condo Insider Edition. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the new year. We have um, some celebrations coming up pretty soon, right? For Chinese New Year coming up pretty soon. Um, so um, today we're going to be talking about um, annual meetings because we're in annual meeting season for the next several months. So um, in a bit, I will introduce our guest. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Hi, really Nice to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. The year has started off really busy already. <laughs> yes, it has. So we're in um, annual meeting season, which is the first part of the year for a lot of um, managing agents. So they're probably bombarded. Um, so I wanted to do a refresher to everybody about what an annual meeting is. And we're gonna be talking more specifically about condos versus um, HOAs, because sometimes there's a little bit different. Um, so why don't we start off with what exactly is an annual meeting? Uh, well, under Hawaii law, uh condominium associations have to meet once a year and they meet once a year in the form of an annual meeting. An annual meeting is when the owners get together uh, and they decide certain issues at the annual meeting that must be decided as a matter of law. And we'll talk about what they are in just a minute, but uh, every condominium association in the state of Hawaii is statutorily required to have an annual meeting. Okay. So it's required. Is there a procedure that everybody needs to follow? Yes, there is. And the base procedure is that a notice of annual meeting has to be sent to owners at least 14 days in advance. Normally, the notice of annual meeting is also posted at the project, but then it's mailed to all, normally mailed to all of the owners at the project. And the notice of annual meeting will normally include such things as uh, the official association proxy, if there is one, and it will also include the agenda for the meeting, and it may include proxy solicitation statements, and we'll talk about those today, uh, for those individuals who are seeking proxies and or those individuals who are running for the board of directors. Okay. So um, usually the board of directors, they have staggered terms. So like if a board is, a board member is, their term is ending, um, so that would end up with a possible vacancy because they may choose not to run. So you could have other people that want to put their their take their opportunity to become a board member. So we're going to start with um, like what exactly is a proxy okay. and what do people do when they get that in the mail. Well, let me move back to your example for just a minute. Uh, there's always going to be, and I'm not going to say always, but the vast 99% of the time, there's going to be at least one vacancy for, uh, uh, like, as you correctly pointed out, for uh, the election of a director. Now, simply because a director chooses whether to run or not doesn't necessarily mean that that changes that there's going to be a vacancy. Because if a director's term is up, whether they decide to run or not, there's still going to be an election for that seat. So, what happens is if the director decides to run again, obviously individuals could still run against that director, or if there's no opposition, then obviously the uh, director will probably be um, reelected. With respect to the proxy process that we want to talk about first is, a proxy is a document which you give to someone else to attend a meeting on your behalf. Only owners can give proxies, but proxy holders do not need to be owners. That's somewhat confusing for many people. So. If you want to give your brother who doesn't own a unit at the project, your proxy, uh, to go to the annual meeting and vote on your behalf, that proxy will allow that individual to do so. A proxy can also be directed to the point that, it, to the extent that it will limit what actions the proxy holder may take on your, um, take on your behalf. Associations also typically, but they're not required by law, to send out an association proxy form. An association proxy form is a form that is drafted by the board of directors and follows a specific format that is required by Hawaii law. It usually has the four magic boxes. One of the boxes will designate that it can be uh, the process can be assigned to the board. One can designate it can be assigned to any individual the owner wants, and another box can say it's going to be assigned for quorum purposes only, which means the proxy holder does not get to vote on anything at the meeting. It simply says present. They're only there, and that's so that the board, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, the association will have a sufficient number of individuals present in person 
or by proxy in order to conduct a business. Okay, so um, a little bit more about the proxy. So usually they're due at a certain time before the actual date of the meeting. That's and set, yeah, and let me stop you there. That's set statutorily, and the statute says they have to be turned in either to the man received by the managing agent or the secretary of the association by 4.30 p.m. on the second business day before the annual meeting. So I had this question posed to me, um, and it usually comes up every year. People are, because they, you know, we only do it once a year. So it's up, within that year, you kind of forget, right? So um, it's it's in state law where a, an employee cannot solicit for proxies, correct? That is correct. And we're referring to a, a employee of the association. So the resident manager can't be, can't be out soliciting proxies. And neither the managing agent cannot be soliciting proxies as well. That is true. So, but what if the um, um, employees, an, uh, an owner, hands a, an employee their proxy? That's not a solicitation of a proxy. You, okay. you brought up an interesting statement. It says that the association employees may not solicit proxies. If the owner wishes to assign their proxy to a resident agent, I mean, I'm sorry, a resident manager, that's not prohibited by Hawaii law. It simply says that the resident manager cannot, an association employee, including their resident manager, cannot solicit proxy. So there's a fine line between a resident manager saying, hey, did you turn in your proxy? And then they go, here, here it is. You know, so it's kind of like, well, did I solicit? Yeah, that's not a solicitation of proxies. And Raylene, that's a great question because we often, if we're getting close that we need a minimum number of persons to attend the meeting and the association doesn't have enough proxies, it is not improper upon the resident manager to collect proxies on behalf of the association to turn them in. But the resident manager cannot knock on people's door and I would like you to give your proxy to so-and-so or please assign your proxy to so-and-so. That's a solicitation of a proxy and that's not permitted under Hawaii law. If the resident manager is only collecting proxies to turn them into the managing agent or the secretary, that is proper. Okay. So to be safe, they should probably give it to um, the secretary, and hopefully they live on site because there's a lot of people that don't live on site, which would make it, it just takes the resident manager out of that equation. Uh, you want to take the resident manager out of the equation to the extent that if someone would later say the resident manager come and took my proxy and said I should assign it to so-and-so, that's an improper solicitation. Right, yeah, so just kind of like cut to the chase, get, her out of, get them out of there, out of that equation. And, and um, Raylene, you already know the good part today is Many people, uh, many managing agents allow you to solicit your proxy by email, and that is extremely convenient for many people. Right, right. Um, and we talked about the proxy can be given to practically um, almost anybody, so they don't have to be an owner of the condo. It can that's be to correct. your partner, your that, friend. That, that's correct. You, know? you, you, you can assign it to any person you desire. The only exception is, and this I've never had this happen, the person has to be mentally competent, and they can't be a minor. They have to be an adult that can act legally on behalf of another person. So you couldn't give it to your 12-year-old daughter uh, to come uh, to your, the annual meeting and vote on your behalf. That would not be legal. Okay, so now let's move to the day of the meeting. Because I always have people get confused with a proxy and a ballot. I had to kind of explain that to someone, the differences between the two. And I go, the proxy is the first step. The ballots are at the meeting. <laughs> right. So the day of the meeting, so what happens? We're going to have a check-in, the managing agent set up with some of their admin people to, with the little laptops and um, check in everybody. Then they're usually given a packet of information um, in there will, will include um, some ballots um, for when they vote on certain issues. You're so, exactly correct. And, and the difference between a proxy and a ballot is, is very confusing for many owners. So let's talk about what it is and let's talk about the procedure. As you point out, Raylene, normally if it's a property that's professionally managed, you'll have uh, employees of the managing agent at a check-in table at the meeting site. You will go and you will sign in. They will uh, take your name. And if it's not you, they will uh, have your proxy will have been turned into the managing agent or the, uh, or the secretary. And they once you check in, they will see that you are the proxy holder for that unit number or that unit individual. And they'll check you in as the proxy holder. As a proxy holder, if you receive a proxy that has no direction on it or, or is an open proxy, then you will have the right to vote that proxy as you see fit uh, in that owner's place. 
uh, you will also receive ballots. The ballots are actually the uh, uh, the instruments that will be used to vote on matters that come up at the meeting. Now, the matter that will definitely come up at the meeting will be the um, election of directors that will normally come up at every single annual meeting. Other issues can come up for a vote. So there will also be, be blank ballots provided to you. They will usually either say motion ballots or, or resolution ballots, something like that. And they are typically a yes, no uh, type of vote for any type of those issues that do come up. Also, there may be more than one ballot, uh, 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 more election ballot handed to you at check-in because there could be more than one election. Let's say we have an, individuals who don't get enough votes to be elected or we have a tie, which could happen at smaller associations. Therefore, it may be necessary to have more than one ballot to elect directors. And as you know, Raylene, that can be very common, particularly at so associations who have minimum vote requirements in order to be elected. Right. right. After the after the check-in procedure, uh, oh, by the way, let me, let me stop, Mick, let's stay at proxies. Let's say you're an owner and you turned in your proxies, turned in your proxy because you didn't know whether or not you were going to be able to attend. You can claim your proxy when you check in and your proxy will no longer be valid and you will be able to vote at the annual meeting. Again, if you've turned in your proxy because you didn't know whether you're going to be able to attend, you can claim it at the end at, at check-in and you will have all your rights to vote and your proxy will no longer be valid. Yeah, we encourage a lot of people, if they're not sure that they're going to be able to attend, we say assign it to someone, but you could always, if you do decide to attend, then you can get you can still get your proxy back, but we need to get the proxies in. Um, so that we can determine whether we have a meeting or not. And, and let's talk about that issue for just a minute before we leave there. The governing documents in an association will say what percentage of owners have to be present in order to conduct business. Now, Raylene, you and I know that's normally a majority, but that's not always the case. Many associations say that you have to have 40%, 30%, and yes, Raylene, even some say only 20% of the owners present in order to conduct a meeting. So it's very important, as you point out, that you advise owners, look, if you don't know whether you're going to be able to attend, if you're not absolutely certain you're going to be there, turn in your proxy. That way, the association will still be able to have a meeting and conduct business. And if you are able to attend, there is no penalty imposed upon you from just claiming your proxy at check-in and participating at the annual meeting as you normally would. Yeah, because we tell people sometimes, like, oh, if you're on, if you have issues and we're on the same page, you know, if you're not sure, we want to make sure your vote counts. So we really want your proxy um, to be turned in. Um, and again, if you're not sure, give it to someone that has your same mindsets um, or agreements on the same issues so that your vote can be counted. So um, so let's talk about what happens after you check in at the meeting, because let, let's go into a little meat and potatoes at that point. Okay. So the chair will call the meeting to order, and normally that would either be the president or the vice president, if the president's unable to chair. Uh, at the annual meeting, they will call the meeting to order, and they will announce Raylene, which is what we're talking about right now, whether or not a quorum's present. They will say the chair has recognized or has been advised there is a quorum present, and then the meeting will get to take place. If a quorum is not present, then the meeting will either be adjourned and nothing will take place again in the future, and the annual meeting will be over, which that is not recommended, or the meeting will be adjourned to a future date and time. That is the more common practice, and here's why. Because what you're doing is you're getting a second chance. The proxies that were submitted for the original annual meeting are still valid, so they'll still be counted. But it will give the board the opportunity and the association the opportunity to solicit more proxies so that you will have the sufficient number of people present in person and or by proxy so that the association can conduct business. So if the chair announces, we have a quorum, business will proceed. If the chair announces we don't have a quorum, the typical procedure is there will be a motion approved to adjourn the annual meeting to be reconvened at a later date and time when you do have, hopefully, enough proxies and people in attendance to conduct business. So who can see um, who turned in the proxies and who have not turned in the proxies? So we can go chasing after the ones that need to turn them in. You know? The managing agent will advise uh, those those owners who have not turned in their proxies. And typically, we recommend that the board uh, instruct the managing agent to contact those individuals who have not turned in their proxies to request that they do so. The purpose of these calls, Raylene, is not to solicit proxies. 
against the listening proxies is the purpose of the call, and it should not be any part of the call, please turn in your proxy and please assign it to so-and-so. That is not a proper phone call. The, the proper rebinding phone call is to please turn in your proxy uh, uh, so that we can conduct business when the annual meeting reconvenes. That's the end. If you don't have a preference on your proxy, please check it as quorum only. That's okay. That's not a solicitation. And then that will ensure that the association conduct business and it will not allow the proxy holder to vote anything on your behalf. So the packets are provided. So now let's move on to um, the ballots. Okay. So uh, the order of business at the annual meeting will be set forth in the bylaws and the election of directors will of course be one of the, of the uh, matters to be uh, uh, taken up or action business that matters to be taken up and vote upon at the annual meeting. The ballots will be typically pre-printed with the names of those individuals who have expressed an interest to run for the board of directors. That may be people who have solicited uh, candidate statements uh, that were included with the packet, with a meeting, notice of annual meeting packet, and or board members who are up for re-election and said, I agree to stand for re-election. There's nothing improper about that, Raylene, and here's why. Even though there's names pre-printed on the ballot that will not generally prohibit anyone from being nominated from the floor, as long as the bylaws pr pr uh, allow it, allowing uh, a, a candidate from the floor to also be nominated to serve on the board of directors. And when they're nominated, the owners at the meeting will be able to write their names on the ballot because the ballot will have plenty of blank. So they're collected. They usually have um, the appointed auditor to collect the ballots. Uh, two tellers normally, two tellers, and they're usually volunteer owners or volunteer attendees, they don't have to be owners, who are not running for the board of directors. Raylene, obviously it can look pretty bad if the person running is collecting the votes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and then usually the admin team will have in front of their laptops, they'll have their little counting that they use. Um, it gets complicated with counting because you have, especially in some buildings where you have a different percent share, right? Versus like, there's some buildings that they're all the same. That's an easy count. But when you have the ones that have like a three bedroom unit versus a one that has a studio, I'm like, I would not want to count that, you know? <laughs> hey, Raylene, you and I know that since we've been doing this, there's been a lot of changes in technology throughout the years too. Many bouts today are barcoded and the barcode uh, indicates what the percentage of common interest is for each unit. That's not used by all management companies, as you know, but for the larger properties, it can really speed up the count time, as you are right. aware. Right. Uh, but 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 there's also the possibility of error because if you don't scan them, then they're not counted. So that's also that's also a potential problem. Uh, the two tellers that collect the ballots, part of their job duties is also to watch the count of the ballots for any irregularities. But it's not their job to count the count the ballot. That's very important. Yeah, because I think we have sometimes we'll have them like say there's 20 people there. We kind of tell them make sure you collect 20 ballots for each, you know, each thing that we're voting on. So we make sure that we have everybody. Um, All true. All true. Okay, so the ballots are folding, but don't they also do um, a tax resolution or something? Yeah, and let, let's, so, so as you pointed out, Raylene, uh, it takes time to count the ballots. So the recess will take place while the ballots are being picked up and while people are being voted. Well, uh, while the ballots are being voted. But after the voting is done, the ballots have been turned in for counting, the meeting can be called back to order. And one of the common uh, uh, types of business that are conducted when the meeting's called back to order is adoption of the tax resolution. What's that mean? Well, most nonprofit organizations for tax purposes can't make a profit. You can't have excess income. But even though you're, you do have money that's left over, you took in more than you paid out, you have to do something with that money as a nonprofit so you're not taxed on it. So the Internal Revenue Service said in 1972 that the members of the nonprofit organization must adopt a resolution rolling that money over to the next fiscal year so they don't have to pay taxes on it. So thus, we have the tax rollover resolution. It is a resolution that has been promulgated by the Internal Revenue Service pursuant to a certain letter ruling. The resolution is read and owners adopt it. If owners do not adopt it, and this is very important, there is a risk that they would be taxed on that excess income, that excess money that they collected, and or 
lose their nonprofit status with the Internal Revenue Service, which would be very devastating for many condominium associations. So even though that is one of those boring, admittedly boring parts of the annual meeting, it is legally required. And the association CPA will always make sure that resolution appears in the minute. Boring, but it's also important and it could be costly. But it it's could not be costly. Yet. It could be costly. The other one that I remember being done is kind of like the rollover of the managing agent contract. Is that? Now that's unlike the IRS tax rollover resolution, which is required by law for uh, uh, most non, not all, not most nonprofit organizations. The approval of the managing agent agreement is normally a requirement set forth in the association's um, bylaws. It's not required by Hawaii law. And what it will say is this typically that the uh, approval of the managing agent and or the approval of the managing agent's contract uh, shall be done in each annual meeting, each annual meeting. Uh, it may require a majority of all owners. I mean, that whatever it says in the bylaws. But typically, it's just like a normal resolution adopted at the meeting, whereby a majority of those present need to uh, need to adopt it. It, it is a uh, it's it's an interesting thing, Raylene, because if the bylaws require the managing agents agreement to be approved and it's not, the board will have, usually have a duty to solicit for a new managing agent contract if owners don't approve it, and the current managing agent will serve month to month until the board selects a new managing agent. Uh, that can be quite tricky. Uh, associations will have to consult their uh, AOAO attorney in the event that that does take place. But if the bylaws require the managing agent's contract or the approval of the managing agent, and it does not occur for whatever reason at the annual meeting, that will trigger some type of change or at least solicitation for a change in the managing agent. Yeah, and it could be tricky too if it's, if it's um, you know, there's like, okay, we didn't get rolled over. So I, I kind of see some tension of business moving forward, you know. Some yeah, sometimes Raylene, it can be a it can be a, a group of, of owners who are upset at the board for whatever reason, and or they're upset the managing agent for whatever reason. And as a result, they want the managing agent off or they want the board to change the managing agent. So they use this this approval requirement to hold up the approval of the managing agent or perhaps defeat the approval of the managing agent to force the board to go out and solicit proposals for another managing agent. Now, important, important thing to keep in mind, even though the managing agent's agreement is not approved at the annual meeting, the board can still allow the current annual meet and managing agent to submit proposals. And again, at the next annual meeting, it's possible that that managing agent will be up for approval. Uh, uh, you can get, you can see you can get into a very vicious cycle. But if the board determines that this managing agent offers the best services for the most um, competitive price, uh, it would not be a breach of the board's fiduciary duty to vote to again award the contract to this managing agent and submit to owners again for approval. But until it's approved, it can only go month to month. It cannot be an annual contract. Okay, so they've had their annual meeting, they had their election, they made their announcements. So it's going to be, um, they're going to announce um, the candidates and their percent of votes for um, each board member. And then, um, so they pretty much conclude the meeting. They're going to celebrate or maybe not celebrate, whichever the case may be. Um, and um, what happens after? The, the board will have an organizational meeting briefly, briefly, immediately after the annual meeting, and the owners may stay. And generally, there's only two types of business that are conducted at the organizational meeting. The organizational meeting will be number one, to elect the officers, the president, the vice president, the secretary, and the treasurer. And those are elected by the board, not by owners, Raylene. Mm -hmm. And the, no, the next course of business will be to set the next, annual, the next board meeting for the new board. So in other words, they're going to set their inaugural board meeting for the new board. That will be the, the, two, uh, the two items of business normally conducted at the organizational meeting. And owners get to sit and watch. Raylene, you and I both know owners usually get out of there, unless yeah. there's food. <laughs> unless there's food. But but if you want to know if you want to know who the officers are going to be for the next uh, board and you want to know when the next annual meeting is going to be before it's announced and posted, you can stay for that and they'll announce that there. And that's not a secret meeting. That's not executive session. Owners get to be present. OK, so after everything's done, is there um, um, in the statute, it says that um, an owner can review the proxies and ballots after the annual meeting? They certainly may. They have to be made available. Uh, and they have to be made available 
uh, to any owner upon request. They don't get copies of all of the documents, Raylene, but they do get copies of some of them. They're specified in the statute, but they may examine the ballots. They may examine the proxies. They may examine the check-in sheets uh, at the office of the managing agent or at another location, usually the project, that the board agrees to make them available for inspection by owners. Like I said, certain documents, the owners are entitled to actually get copies of them, but other documents, for example, the ballots, uh, they can only be made available. They're only made available for inspection. Right. Yeah, that would be too hard to call. Right. Take copies of all those ballots. <laughs> right. But you can come look and see how uh, you can look at each ballot. Uh, we all remember pictures of the Florida hanging chads where people were inspecting ballots and holding them up to light or whatever. You can certainly go inspect the ballots uh, as an interested owner if you if you wish to do so. And you can see the tally sheets and see how they were calculated. And one other point that just came to my head, came to my memory about the proxies. So sometimes you have to remember that the proxy has the name of the has to have the name of the owner and the unit number. So if you're um, someone that is trying to get onto the board, um, and you know you're trying to solicit, like some of us will just make copies, but we we kind of take off white out the you know the names. But we want to make sure we put in that person's name and the unit number before we turn them in. Um, uh, four things. Four things, Eileen. Uh, Raylene, uh, printed name of the owner, mm -hmm. owner signature, mm -hmm. owner unit number, mm -hmm. and date. date. Those four things must be on the proxy. Okay. Cool. I think we're nearing. We did a great job getting it all in a nutshell. You know, <laughs> getting it in that twenty minutes. Well, we got a lot of information out in twenty minutes, and obviously, if you have any questions, I recommend owners contact their managing agent uh, for additional information regarding this very important topic. So um, this is going to get, we're going to email it blast because it's going to, it's a good refresher, a good reminder of the annual meetings and the ballots and the proxies and, the, and that procedure. Um, Chris, I really want to thank you um, for taking time out of your day. Um, I know it's been, God, for, January has just been busy, just crazy busy. Um, taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in our Condo Insider. And don't forget, everyone, we're doing our next in-person seminar at Oahu Country Club on February 16th. It's a Thursday. It is a um, buffet, and it's going to be on benchmarking. The, it, it became effective into law um, January, and the per first reporting is June 2023. So it's kind of really important. Um, setting up the, the software is a little, a little complicated. So um, we're going to have the resilient Oahu team um, on site. Um, to do the demo on how to set it up. Um, and they're actually making out some tutorials, little um, tutorial guides um, to also help with that. And we also want to make sure that um, everybody comes early because some of our condo attorneys will be present. So you guys can come out and meet and greet your, your attorneys and um, talk story with them. And then maybe ask them any questions that you have that, um, that you need to. So Chris, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Raylene. Have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a nice Friday, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.